Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Manson Saga discussion panel, Interviews Michael Brunner. I'm Paul, that's Danny After Dark, like and subscribe, and holy cow, I cannot believe we're here. Um, we've been chatting about wanting to do this for a very long time, but <laughs> as like a smart move that uh, Mike's made, he has stayed as far out of the bullshit as he possibly can. <laughs> so we're going to, we're going to start off. We're going to chat for a couple minutes, and then we will be joined by the one and only Michael Brunner. So, and one of the reasons we're doing this is to help Mike and his brother Daniel put to bed all this nasty bullshit that has gone on with, you know, Freeman debacle and the whole, just the whole nightmare up even to the uh this court case for the estate so whatever if you guys want i've pinned the pinned the uh the link so if you guys want to get tickets to the raffle they're 25 dollars each five for a hundred or 30 for 500 um, which is amazing which is amazing and anything that you can give if you just want to uh if you just want to donate, you're like, I don't need anything. I just want to throw a couple bucks their way. Absolutely. Yes. Do it. It's a great cause. It's like basically a family trying to stop this shit from being spread through the mud anymore. It's it's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yeah. So Danny, you want to add anything? Yeah, and I was just gonna say Mike Brunner is. I mean, he'll be on with us shortly, but he is absolutely amazing and so just genuine and real. And I can't see why anybody wouldn't want to help him out, you know, him and his family during this time. I bought my raffle tickets to support. But again, like Paul said, if people even want to make a donation, but nece don't necessarily want any raffle items, you know, even 10 bucks, you know what I mean? Like a, a Starbucks drink or something like that, you know, just think of it that mm -hmm. way. Instead of going to Starbucks this week, just make a donation towards Mike and it, it would go such a long way. Yeah. And he's being very generous mm -hmm. doing this interview with us and wanting to get the, get the information out there. There's like, there's three places I can think of that you can find uh, Mike Brunner talking. There's the interview he did with Nicholas Shrek. Then there's the LA times and some other TV station and that's it. Yeah, that's it. Because he's fucking smart. <laughs> he's smart. He's stayed out of the swamp as long as he could. But yeah. I mean, like, it's funny because like, he, you want to say you want to empathize with the guy because of like his his the way he was born into this crazy thing. But no, like, how can you? Nobody could even understand at all like growing up this way and it'll be nice to be able to ask him some questions and just have a little little overview of what the fuck it's like growing up growing up Manson you know what I mean yep and yeah yep. so yeah he doesn't want any attention he doesn't want anything hello dreamers dream y'all yeah it's he's he's the most level-headed guy I've I've like almost ever met and he's and it's like he has no reason to be. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, so he's going to he's going to pop up down at the bottom and we'll bring him up as soon as he's ready to go. Uh but until then, we will just be chatting, checking, see what's going on in the in the uh chat. Looks like we have a troll here named Mr. Beckham. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Hello, everyone. Okay, let's see. Thank here. you, everybody, for joining. And we'll plug the raffle several times tonight. So, like Paul said, he has it pinned, um, but we will mention it several times. So, no excuses. You can't say you didn't hear about it. Yeah. <laughs> 
And you know what? Because you guys see us all the time and we're boring as shit. Why well, don't you are not me? Well, I mean me. Yes, of course. I only speak for myself. But without further ado, I think we should bring up the man of the hour. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, a man who needs no introduction in this room, but's going to get one anyway. <laughs> Mr. Michael Brunner. Hello, sir. Hi. You guys are too much. <laughs> oh, stop. Oh, stop. Uh, it looks like, like oh, I mean ever, Danny. How you doing, Mike? Good, good. Good seeing you guys. Yeah, Always you, great to Mike. see you. Thanks very much for coming up and, uh, and having a little chin wag with us. No problem. You know, um, I, I thought I'd grab all these raffle prizes, and, and in doing so, I found a letter that I got. Really? If you, um, well, don't get too excited, but have you guys seen this um, this insert that was in the original Lie album? Wow. Here, let me make you big. Uh, there you go. Hey, I'm big. Hey. <laughs> wow. I got this from... Um, a guy that you haven't seen much of lately, Manny Manuel V. Okay. And he wrote me a letter about um, this insert. And there's a lot of, I could read you the whole thing. It's not long. But sure. what was really interesting to me in regards to this, but, uh, uh, hang on, where'd it go? Oh, just in case, oh, P.S., uh, one more thing. Just in case you didn't know, this insert of supposed prisoners. Here, let me show you again. Okay. I'm sure a lot, a lot of people have seen this, but for those of you that haven't, you've got all across the top here, you've got all these different characters. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. And a lot of signatures and di different things. Um, in case you didn't know, this insert of supposed prisoners' signatures is not what it seems. Charlie forged every one of these autographs and hid a lot of messages in it. It it is it's a oh I know I can't read it. He was in jail at the time and had way too much to communicate. But anyway, so that's all Charlie doing all these. I mean, none of these. I wish I had a better camera. Oh no, you can see it really well. I'm gonna make you big again. Yeah, make him yeah. <laughs> wow. And so did he does he know how to crack the code? Like, does he know how to decipher it? Or it's just like, that's it. There's he something in there. He, he never, never told me. And I, I meant to ask a few times back in there. Now, you know, I haven't talked to him in a few years. Um, wow. And I saw he, he popped up on Instagram and I sent him a message and I never heard back. I, you know, I don't know. Right. He kind of comes and goes. He's like the wind, man. Right. <laughs> we'll have to wait for the next gust to see if we can get a, uh, see if we can get some answers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he was a good guy. I mean, we, we hung out quite a bit. We met him in Vegas when we um, went out to, to, to uh, Death Valley with Nicholas and uh, oh, a number of other people. But we, we met up with, with Manny in, in Vegas and then went from Vegas. We took the, uh, the back way into uh, to death into uh, to Barker Ranch, right? And it, was, it was quite an experience. I bet, man! Holy yeah. cow! The thing that I keep I keep thinking about Barker Ranch is I would love to see the sky at Barker Ranch because there is just nothing, no ambient light. It's mm -hmm. dude, like you're so lucky. Was it amazing? It it was pretty incredible. Now I had I had lived in an area like that. Um, for a year I was, I was overseas working with the military and I was on a, a blackout base and, um, you know, so the enemy can't see you, you know, I mean, they know where you are, but, but at night they, you know, they didn't want the lights on. So yeah. at night it would, uh, yeah, a full moon, you, you'd almost feel like you're getting a, a moon burn. And <laughs> cause I mean, it was, wow. it was just, it, you'd, you'd learn to live, um, by the moon. You know I mean? If, if it's a full moon, you don't need a flashlight. But right. you know, it's dark, man, and you get caught out in there, you're running into stuff, you know, because it's it's so extreme, you know, through you know, just one month, you right. know, you go from that, that light to that dark. And so, where was this? You'd said you were you were overseas? That was Afghanistan. Wow. I was working as a, a contractor for the for the military. So 
wild. Yeah. 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 Crazy experience. That's a, that's a place that not a lot of people get to go in that capacity, especially now, but like, that's right. Wild. right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, my hat's off to the soldiers. I was, I was on a base. I was safe. I, you know, it wasn't, wasn't like I was out there fighting the war. It was right. the, the, I mean, the, the soldiers, man, to go out outside that wire every day, oh, man, yeah. you know, yeah. can't say enough for the troops, man. Right. Yeah. Hats off always for yeah. sure. And, and, you know, we, we lost some people there, you know, friends and, and people I was at least acquainted with. And it, it, it's really sad, but you know, yeah. it's, it's what it is. World's a crazy place. Right. And that's why there's, that's why it should help people like that. There should be more in place to, to prop people that, that do that stuff and have to live with that after coming back. Oh, to be able sure. to have them live great lives because mm -hmm. of what they had to do and what they had to sacrifice to do it. You know, even even the guy that 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 didn't have to see any action, he sacrificed. Like he missed Christmas with his family. He missed so much, you know, and 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 went through so much to get there. Yeah. Um, oh, I'm getting off off subject. No, here. that's Sorry, it's, I've, I've but no, no. Go here. No, <laughs> that's good. I mean, this is the this is the thing. It's 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 we're just chatting, right? Like it's, 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 neat to, it's neat to neat to be able to, to just have a conversation and, and see where, you know, like what things are sort of important to you and into your life right now. Cause we're, I mean, we're, we're dipping in a bit to your life and lives connected to you. So I mm -hmm. think that, that knowing that is just as important as anything else. Mm -hmm. All right. Then. Here yeah. we are. I'm an open Here book. What do you guys got for me? You got questions? Oh yeah. Oh buddy, we are we are so <laughs> professional. We put the pro in professional over here. Um, <laughs> don't I prepared. Too hard. Paul just showed up. <laughs> yeah. Just... Oh man. All right. Well, Danny, do you want to kick us off on the on the actual on the actual questions we got going here? Oh wow. Before we do that, though, thank you for your service. JK, and thank you very much for the tip. That's awesome. I was a soldier, three tours in Afghanistan. Much respect for the contract. Wow. Awesome. Thank you. We had it pretty easy compared to you, buddy. Yeah, man, that's <laughs> awesome. Thank you for speaking up uh, on that. Uh, so, okay. Appreciate and it, sir. All right. So, Mike, mm. so mm. you are typically a very quiet mm. behind the scenes person. And obviously you, you're coming forward here tonight. Um, we talked a little bit why you were coming here, but to hear it from you. So what makes you come here tonight in the reason, you know, the reason that we're here? Well, the, 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 the raffle is the big thing, of course. Um, um, I was blessed to, to find a half brother, you know, so late in light life. Um, Danny was, um, in an active search looking for his, his, uh, father and lo and behold, guess who it was. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. Imagine getting that news. Yeah. Yeah. So, so let me tell sorry. you something. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, so who, who got in contact first? How did that work? So I had, I had, I had, I had tried an, a number of different ways to get an actual DNA sample and none of them seemed to work. You know, I, I mean, I was pretty sure of my lineage, you know, 98% sure, but there's that 2%, you know, it sure would be nice when you know the coroner has got a sample, I'll pay for the, the 300 bucks for the, the DNA test, not a big deal, just, you know, help a brother out, but it's not as easy as you might think. Um, right. So I ended up going on Ancestry thinking if I could find a link there, you know, just to, you know, calm my brain and, and, and you know, settle things once and for all, 100%. And after looking through that, I noticed well, this one guy, you know, I didn't know much about it. The one guy is always, you know, he's way up high on the list and, and things just, you know, they're higher than a lot of my close family and figured he's, he's got to be a brother, you know? Right. So yeah. um, I asked a few people that, that do know more about ancestry and they agreed. And then, and then I reached out to Danny and, right. and 
he didn't get back to me right away, but, but when we, we finally hooked up, you know, I, I didn't tell him right away. We just, we just talked for oh well, maybe a week or two, I don't know, two, two, three, maybe four times before I, you know, it, you could tell that he was, he was strong enough to handle something like this and had an open enough mind um, to, to accept what I was about to tell him. And, and he, he handled it like a trooper, you know? Um, right. Yeah. What did he say when you, when you actually like got it out to him and was like, well, here you go. Yeah. I, I could not tell you word for word, you know, my, no, my memory course. isn't great to start off with. And then I'm spinning, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm about sure. to, to rock this guy's world, you know, I'm thinking, yeah. eh, you know, but, uh, I think I said something like, are you sitting down? Yeah, I'm sitting down. And, and he just took it. Like I, I told him it was Joe blow, you know, um, right. you know, um, right. and then, you know, after a little bit, he was, I, I think a little bit, uh, you know, are you sure, you know, are you sure about all this? And I pointed out the, uh, the, the information that I had found on ancestry, um, in regards to other people in our family. And, um, and then we ended up doing another, uh, test just to make sure that, that we were, you know, it wasn't something screwed up with ancestry. And, and we right. did that with, uh, uh, a lab, um, that I had worked with before in, um, Hollywood or West Hollywood, somewhere out there. And, um, yeah, it came back 99.999. I forget how many, nine, eight yeah. percent chance. I mean, it, it's a pretty good chance. Yeah, that we're, <laughs> yeah. That we're kin. Yeah, that's so. that's amazing, and and he's not a brunner, so there's only one other option. <laughs> right, right. Unreal. Um, so yeah, I mean, and he uh, he immediately took right to the idea. I mean, and well, maybe not within the first couple of weeks. He was, uh, you know, he he got right in. He's he's starting to watch. He I, I, really, it was almost like the transformation that I had um, when I when, when after Charlie passed. You know, all of a sudden, I needed to know everything, and he needed to know everything. And he started watching the the, the interviews and the the different footage and reading and and studying and and you know about the whole era, and just consuming as much information as he could get you know so it's right it was good and i would do every every monday i would send him and his daughter a little um something you know uh, songs or you know just a little something fun that i'd find you know right uh, mostly music you know yeah. um and uh i did that for a few weeks so, yeah and and her, his daughter um uh, really did the did about the same thing she started looking into things and and the two of those those them together really they uh they were very impressive people man um i'm so That's happy awesome. to find them. yeah and like and like you say like so late in life you find you find family that you didn't know you had and it's and it's in a capacity that like this has just been you like i can't even imagine how like solo a feeling that is Right. Like, yeah. it's just like, and then all of a sudden you've got this, you're like, holy shit. There's somebody else that, that can identify with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Which, which is incredible. And, and such a like once in a lifetime or not even like once in every hundredth person's lifetime. It's crazy. It, it almost feels like it, it feels like it went from me to a team. You know what I mean? Yeah. Where, you know, we're, we're together and we're, we're, um, we could discuss things, you know, that, that you can't really discuss with just anybody, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. That's fucking awesome, Mike. Yeah. That yeah, is great. Huge. Um, I want to, I want to do a, a shout out to our, our friend Linda here. So generous. We're going to forward this to, to Mike, to the, uh, to the raffle. Michael, you're a decent person. I hope you win this case. It belongs to you. And I think that's, I think that's the sentiment that, most of us, if not all of us watching right now, definitely well, now, feel this. This is for for Daddy. I mean, we're we're working together on things, but I mean, it's not just me. I, I mean, yeah. But I I mean, I support him a hundred percent, wholeheartedly, man. I mean, you know, um, when when Charlie first died, I I really 
my thought was he knows what he's doing and, and whatever he, he did to set things up, that's probably what he wants. Right. Yeah. I mean, if he didn't want anybody to, to take care of his body, he wanted it to go through the, the channels. He, that's what he would have done. If he wanted somebody, he would have asked somebody. Um, and I felt like the reason I got in, it wasn't so I could control anything. It was more protect, if that makes sense. Right. Yeah. Yeah, no, it absolutely does. Well, who, who did he have in his corner? Right. Like the, the thing that one of the big things is he, that I think anyways, he rejected everything to do with society. Right. He, he thought his own way, he, all this sort of stuff. So when there's, you know, there was things like, like, oh, you should sign this so that we know what to do with your body, right? Like that, I'd imagine to him is the same thing as those stories about we're going to put your nose on that fucking wall. And he's like, you yeah. beat the shit out of me and whatever. I'm not putting my nose on that fucking wall. And so if they're like, you have to sign this and go fuck yourself. I'm not going to sign this thing. Right. And uh, which unfortunately was a bit of a double edged sword because then it leaves it free for the, the scavengers and the fucking grave robbers to come and, and use his body the way that they did. He, he was asked not just by the, by the system, but he was asked by friends to, uh, to get that handled. And he, he flat out refused from what right. I, I've, I've heard that from multiple people that, that they tried to talk him into, you know, doing something, you know, do something about it. And he just, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't want to. Right. So oh. where does that leave? Either he wanted a mess at the end, in which case he got it, <laughs> or, <laughs> or he just wanted to be dealt with, uh, you know, the way the prison system deals with other prisoners. I mean, that, that was his life. That's where he grew up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's, he, that's the man that he, he spent his life with. Right. And the thing, and the thing is, I'm pretty sure we can all agree on one thing. He didn't want fucking a bunch of uh, caustic poisons put in his body that were going to then go into the atmosphere and the earth and the water and everything like that and just completely do the opposite of every of every good thing he talked about. And every the like it's just absolutely maddening and it shows that the people that did that had none of his best interests not they it was a greedy disgusting pageant it was just like and and it's yeah it's crazy and it shouldn't have happened but it all but yeah long story long that's <laughs> not how he would have wanted it to be done and i think everybody even people who don't know him would think that's not it. So if you have somebody in your family, you're going to do the exact opposite of what they want you to like. Doesn't sound like a fucking family member to me. Sounds like yeah. bullshit. Well, you, you hit a good point. I mean, I, I, I've had people say, well, Charlie didn't care what happened to him. He was, you know, after his dad, it's just a shell. Sure, it's just a shell. But but um, the embalming process, I mean, that's uh, you know, all, all the, the toxicity that that releases sure right. would have been against him. And I don't believe anybody would want to have their body filmed and, and no. you know, marketed that way. Yeah. yeah. No, but, it, it was, it was like, I can't believe it was legal. I can't believe that something like that was allowed to happen. I, I did some searching, you know, at that time I was, I was digging into things. And now if you were an American Indian, yeah. <laughs> some, of the, some of the things that been would have been illegal that, that happened, but as right. as uh, a white person, I suppose because of it, the the way they were degraded or, or you know, yeah, they disrespected in death, you know, back up uh, hundreds of years ago, a hundred years ago, um, they they put those laws in place, which good for right. them. Absolutely, they had to, right? Yeah, and then yeah, and then it just had nothing nothing to protect him from the vultures and the vultures swooped in and and did what they do with feed on the fucking corpse it's crazy yeah. and big thank you to ben this will also be pushed forward to uh 
to the fund. Thanks so much. Yeah, I just want to add, you know, obviously we're here to push the raffle, but if anybody, you know, even just doesn't want any of the raffle prizes, but still wants to make a donation, obviously you can donate to Mike's PayPal, or even if you make a donation here through YouTube, anything tonight when we have with Mike on, we're going to pass it right to Mike. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So, so I have been getting quite a few of those people that, that say, you know, here's a hundred bucks. Uh, don't, don't worry about putting my name in the hat, but I've been doing it anyway. And I'm thinking what, what we'll do is, is if somebody that, that is, put, I, I'm making notes of it. If somebody mm -hmm. um, that says, I don't want it, um, wins it, I will call them and, and then they can figure out what to do with it. If, if right. they want me to pull another name, we'll pull another name if they want me to. Right. That's um, fair. If they change their mind. Oh, I really did win. Yeah, I do want it. You know, it's, yeah. I mean, it's their right. So, right. Oh, that's even, awesome. Yeah, I, I've been, you know, and then there's been quite a few people that say that, you know, they, they throw, <laughs> oh, wow. How humbling is that? You know, to, you, you, you try to put this great prize package together and, and thank you to all the people that have donated there too. I mean, they're unsung heroes. I mean, the prizes are, are great, I think. Absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. The only thing I really put in there myself was that that uh, the lie album, right? Yeah. Which is awesome. Which is like in and of itself is a fantastic prize, right? Not oh, to mention the, all the rest. The the CDs I had been given at another time, but it was uh, it, it was a uh, a close friend gave me those, and, yeah. and and Manny helped. Manny was a, a record guy. He actually uh, produced one of Nicholas's records. Produced oh, wow. or put out, I, I don't know the term, but he did worked with Nicholas on one of his albums. Um, and uh, he had found that he, I think he had owned a record store or maybe he still does. I don't know in Los Angeles. And I don't know. He, he was in that business. And he found it finally a good deal on that. On that That's one. Just to be honest, you know, I, I got it right here. The cover is a little, a little tattered, but it is, you know, 50 some odd years old. So uh, right. it's the OG. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's the original. I'm not so, sure yet if our co-host, uh, Mr. Beckham, has purchased his raffle tickets, but if he has not, make sure when he does, put my name as if he gets pulled in <laughs> <me>, So <laughs> That's only right. I mean, you've been carrying them all these years, right? Right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Mike, you have no idea. <laughs> no idea the pain. Yeah. Oh my Beckham God. Beckham says, "Is he there? I, I think I just heard him say fuck. Yeah. We have started. Um, for okay, Mister Beckham is asking, but yes, it's we a, have started. Should be pinned at the very top. Yep. Should the link should be at the if, very top. So, Mike, I know not, we went. I'll do oh, it again. Like we've gone all around right now having you up, but you don't do many interviews. So, and I think this is a great opportunity to." ask you just some kind of more going back basic questions to hear from you. Cause we, you're in, it's funny. Cause I'll be, you know, I read a lot and, you know, reading about this case, I read about you all the time, which is so weird. Cause I'm just like, Oh, that's like my friend now. And I'm just reading about him in a book, but let's hear from you. So we know who you are and who your parents are. Um, but if you don't mind a little bit of how you were raised, who raised you, just a little bit of your background growing up for those who might not know. I, I was um, raised by Mary's, my mother's parents. And they adopted me, I, not right away. I think I, I went to them when I was about uh, a little less than two years old and stayed with them. And I think I was probably, God, was it maybe going into first grade when that summer they adopted me? So there's wow. a party in the neighborhood and, you know, it was like a, a second birthday party that year. It was right. I mean, bigger than a birthday party. You know, all the neighbors got together and, and I remember I got a, a clock radio that I probably still have. It was like my prized possession for a lot of years, you know, uh, you know, a, a first grader with his first radio, you know, um, right. back in the day, that was more important than it is now, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I had my I had my tape player too when I was a kid. I was ready right. to go. Yeah. yeah. I didn't get a tape player until I was much older, but you know. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um and they were they were good, I mean, very wholesome people, you know, religious. I did, that didn't really stick with me quite as much as it probably should have. Um right. but um 
they were very, you know, on, on top of me. They didn't let me get away with a lot. Um, right. You know, um, I, I look at how kids are today and man, if I had said some of the stuff that I hear kids telling their parents today, man, <laughs> well, I, I think that's everybody. We would have gotten the, the, this boot, the spoon, the belt, oh, yeah. and, you know. Yeah. Oh, sometimes I hear th things kids say and I look at my kid, I'm like, don't you ever do that. <laughs> like, yep. that's insane right that's crazy yeah no i would have got chucked in the utility room there you know, fuck off kid <laughs> like get out of here yeah oh man um, I, I had a conversation with a kid um a, a few weeks ago about how uh growing up i didn't believe anything my parents told me i, I call my parents okay uh, with the adoption right, sure. so yeah. let me let me step back i i call i got Mom and dad are Elsie and George, my grandparents. Yes. Mother and father, <laughs> Charlie and, and Mary, or Mary right. and Charlie. Um, yeah. So I don't know if that'll help anybody keep it straight, but it helps me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, well, it's very the, helpful. Yeah. It is, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, now what the hell was I talking about? You were talking uh, a conversation recently with a kid. Oh, yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I was telling them how I... I didn't, you know, I was, I was told this by my parents, but I thought they were wrong. They didn't know what they were talking about. I always knew better, you know, yeah, I think yeah. everybody goes through this. Right. But then when you get a little bit older, no, they were right. They're right yeah. about everything. I was wrong about everything I can, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Anything that was screwed up in my life was my fault. And I was warned not to do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> no shit. I know. I get older and I see like, I see my kid do something and I phone my mom and I'm like, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Awesome. Um, so, okay. So on that same vein of you, of you being brought up by your grandparents, when did, when did you learn about your lineage? Like the, the Manson and Mary part of your lineage and how was Mary involved in your life pre you knowing about that? Um, you know, when you, when you grow up and, and they're not there, they're not very important to you. You know, when you're a kid, and Mary would call, I don't, I don't, it was always on Sundays. I don't remember if it was every other Sunday. And, you know, it was like almost, I, I hate to say it now, but I'm, I'm trying to be dead honest is, uh, it was always something you kind of had to do. You had to get on the phone and you had to say, I love you. And you had, you know, right. It, it didn't mean much to a to an eight year old six year seven year old you know right um, but i think uh, hopefully it meant something to her because you know yeah, yeah of course of course yeah yeah and i know no, Elsie and George love getting the calls right you know well, so, that's good so but you know um i you know I, I see that with other kids too they, even if they know their parents <laughs> they want to yeah. talk to them like oh, i got better things to do but um right it, it's it's hard when you you don't know the person you don't remember the person you know you know she'd send gifts and you know you're grateful but you know they weren't uh they weren't tonka trucks <laughs> you right. know there's things she was making and they're beautiful things a lot of stuff i still have um right. uh, in fact listen to this um i have so i just moved from uh up north and i'm in a different house as a, within the last couple of years and uh I had put stuff in storage and going through stuff since then, I just wanted to get that storage area cleaned out this summer. And I was going through and I found a calendar that Lynette had made, not Lynette, excuse me. <laughs> um, Leslie had made me with oh, all wow. these little characters. I mean, every month, like April, there's a little boy standing there with his umbrella, you know, April showers. And then in May, he's throwing the flowers and, you know, in December he's opening up Christmas presents, you know, it's right. I, you know, all hand. Oh, just what a find, you know, I, I remember right. from a kid and when I was a kid, but somehow I'd gotten stuck with all this other stuff that I finally went through it. And wow. <laughs> you know, right. and it has a whole different meaning now, right? Like, like sure. you say with, uh, like you say, when you're a kid, I mean, you're a kid. So it's just like, like you, like you talking to Mary on the phone. It's like, here, come talk to this person. You're like, fuck, I just yeah. want to play with my truck. <laughs> like, um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's dated seven, 1973. So yeah, five year old. And but um, but Elsie had it, you know, bound, got it all bound up and and kept it nice. I mean, it wasn't like, um, damn Manson's, you know. She she kept it and Jamie, you know, 
I thank her for that. You know, yeah. awesome. Yeah. yeah, and it's neat too because you told a story on I, I believe it was, I think it was on the L.A. Times thing, um, that there was a letter that you had gotten that mm -hmm. from from Manson from your your father, and right. and Elsie had had gotten you to to get rid of it, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. You do you want to tell that story because I think the I think the end of it is kind of reminds me of what you were just saying about her taking the care even though she knew the background of that thing to to keep that funny just just before the show somebody called me up and asked me if i ever got a letter from charlie <laughs> and I said, well, oh, I funny talked about, in, I talked about it in the uh the la times interview um yeah she, uh, um she had you know i think wanted me to to uh you know, she didn't. She didn't want me to start hanging out with Charlie. Right. <laughs> you know? Yeah, and I didn't know. You know, again, I forget the year seventy seven, maybe. So I would have been nine. Right. I'm making this up. So I'm, it was when I was a young kid. Yes. And, yeah. Yeah. And uh, she asked me, "Why don't you just rip that up?" You know, and and I did. You know, mm -hmm. um, and then. Uh, but she had already made a photocopy of it. And then after Charlie passed, another family member had that photocopy and, and gave it to me. So I, I still have it now. Right. Wow. And that's, that's amazing because, because mm -hmm. I mean, from guessing from her perspective, right? Like not only is like, she has you on account to this thing, but, but like that's, that happened to her daughter. The whole thing that happened happened to her daughter, but she thought enough like of that. This is still your father and that she kept it so that when you were old enough to understand, mm -hmm. it's like, or and, when and she let, thought you were old enough to. Yeah. And let me read it. I mean, I, I think a lot of parents in that situation or a lot of grandparents would have maybe opened it themselves and read it or, right. you know, whatever. It shows and, that they were, that they had like, good respect for you as well. Like the, which is what you're supposed to have for your kids as well. You're supposed to teach them, but you're also supposed to know that they're going to eventually grow up. And, and, and that's just, that's a huge tip of the hat to your grandparents. You know, they never lied to me, but the, the things that they were telling me was, were the things that they believed. And of course they believed what they heard on the, the five o'clock news or the nightline right. or the, what was it back then? Phil Donahue, or I don't remember what it was back then, but right, right. Fifty minutes. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's go on. I think so, but fucking none of the old characters are on there. <laughs> right. There's no, no, no. Whatever Bradley or <laughs> those people. Just um, want to yeah. give a quick shout out. Thank you, Glenn, for the donation. Yeah. We'll pass that on to oh, my. Thank you, everybody. He looks familiar. Oh, I think I just talked to him on Stoner Show. <laughs> oh, neat. Um, <laughs> so, Mike, when did so? You know, you've talked about you know that how your your uh, parents were in regards to when did you in regards to them? When did you start to ask them more questions, wanting to start to learn more? At what point did that happen? Well, I you know I I think I was asking them you know as soon as I could talk, probably, you know, I mean, you, you're talking to Mary on Sunday. Well, that's, that's your real mom. Well, who's my real dad? And, you know, again, I don't think they'd lie, but it was, they would tell me his name, but I couldn't, would, wouldn't remember, <laughs> you know? Right. Um, yeah. You it know, wouldn't, it wouldn't click that way. Right. And I, I would ask, you know, I, I know I, I probably asked him at least a half a do dozen different times, you know, his, his name and, and, uh, they would, uh, where am I going to go with that? I, I'd ask the questions and they'd tell me the answers. I mean, they wouldn't, uh, you know, when I was three years old, I don't think they were telling me, yeah, you killed a bunch of people. They right. would, uh, <laughs> you know, sugar. They, oh, he was a crazy guy. You know, he's a tell it like they were telling a kid. Yeah. A, a crazy guy that your, your mom got involved with and, and shouldn't have, or, you know, I mean, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, it Growing up in a relatively small town, you know, everybody, I mean, they had to be strong people to, <laughs> to, right. to live with that. And, 
um, that's how it finally hit me that it was more than, than just, uh, you know, a crazy guy because I started get, I got a note from a kid in, in school about your father is a murderer. Um, right. and I'm sure, you know, he heard it from his parents or his older siblings or whatever. And, and that, that kind of brought things out to light a little bit. Right. Wow. And so you'd, you'd, you'd mentioned about like what your grandparents knew on account of the media and mm -hmm. like you started to have to learn about your lineage and there's just so much. So there's, we talk a lot about the impact of the waves of misinformation being thrown around by like flash in the pan hacks and people that are just trying to, trying to make a quick buck. Um, do you, let's see here. How was I going to say, has it, I mean, obviously it's probably made it a little more difficult, but what are your thoughts on, on it being so easily misused and that people don't think about the impact on the families of all the people involved, not just the victims, but on every side, because everybody who isn't the perpetrator on some level is, is a victim of sorts. What, what really gets me is, is how they can take a real person and turn him into a character, you know, like, um, Oh, I, I never made it through the, uh, Quentin Tar Tarantino movie, but, uh, that Aquarius, I mean, they had Charlie on there, but I mean, they're making up what he's saying, right? Yeah. You know? That was something that was something. Um, you know, so he's a, now a, become a fictional character in these things. You take a fictional character like Superman and I couldn't take Superman and have him say whatever I want him to say, but they can right. take He's copyrighted. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. But but Charlie, anybody can have them say and do whatever they want in a movie, right? And with, at, oh, yeah, or in a book or anything. Or and so yeah. for people along the way who have to learn, like you, Danny, uh, Danny's daughter, like people that are that are going to have to wade through all this bullshit. Now there's just and it just keeps getting piled on, and you guys have to dig really hard to try and find your lineage, and you also have to listen to people say fucking horrible things about, you know, your relative. Um, really, it's it's not just us; it's everybody that that is stuck in the same quagmire. I mean, maybe we, I mean, care more than the average person, but you care more than the average person. Sure, you know, mo yeah. most people don't care at all. You know, this is what it is. Whatever the media tells me, that's what it is. And I don't care to look any farther. And to be honest, I, that was me, you know, for a long right. time. I didn't, uh, I didn't know that there was another side of the story. Right. You know, right. Um, and you know, I, I, I have regrets. I, you know, I, I wish I would have pulled my hand, head out of the sand years and years earlier, you know, mm -hmm. um, I, uh, I, I was gonna actually the the day that uh, I had heard heard Charlie was back in the hospital on a Friday in in November uh, 2017 I think it was and that Saturday morning I did try to try to get a hold of him and at that point if I would have been able to get a hold of him I think I would have said something to the fact that I, I I forgive you I you know but really he didn't need forgiven did he right you know, I mean, depending on how you look at it. But uh, sure. I mean, I don't think he did anything to me, <laughs> you know? Right. Well, the so, thing is, yeah. It's not, my point, not, it's not my place to forgive, right? I think just, yeah, I think it would like for, to make sense, to make sense of it, it would just be more of like a, you talking to him in general would just be a healing thing for both of you, regardless of uh, any apologies or, or forgiveness or anything like that. And it's, it's, I mean, it's a story as old as time things happen and, and we can't help, we can't help it. But the way you were raised, like it's, it's no wonder that, that you just didn't, didn't think of it for a super long time. Right. For old school values, it's your, it's like Mary's parents and all that stuff. It's, it, it was yeah. kind of a taboo subject, you right. know, it was a taboo yeah. subject in my in my home, and and I brought that into the world too. I mean, if people wanted to talk to me, I'd shut them right down. 
right you know, it was yeah yeah of course you know so so i yeah. I, I was taught not to <laughs> not to want to learn about it i guess you know right absolutely and and it makes total sense and when you're raised that way you, why why would you go against it mm -hmm. it's really interesting because i've been able to talk to ivan as well ivan pew and he was he's one of the the kids that was that was at the ranch sure. but he when he grew up it was an open subject and it's just so interesting that like you guys had the total polar opposite <laughs> thing. it's just it's yeah. it's wild yeah um so let's see here danny do you want to uh so you, you mentioned i know you mentioned the story of the one boy you know passing you the note um but you you just mentioned now anytime people would bring it up you'd shut it down growing up in the community that you did did you know people knew who you were were you besides that one incident treated any differently or were you just one of the community like everybody else I, I'd like to say I was one of the community like everybody else, but you know, when you have that in your background, you don't know if people have ulterior motives. Is that the way to say it? Yeah. If yeah. They, mm -hmm. if they're, uh, are you hanging out with me because we get along? Or are you hanging out with me because you want to, you think I'm famous or something, you know? Right. And yeah, yeah. I don't think many people did that, but it's always in the back of your mind, you know? I mean, you're, you're questioning things all the time and, and that takes a little bit of a toll on a person, but yeah. of course not, not huge. I made it yeah, through. Yeah. 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 No, no, you've, I yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, most people, I think the consensus is we're all like, Holy shit. He's so like mellow. So, so level. And, and just like, fuck, I had compared to you, I had the chillest childhood in the world and I'm a fucking nutcase. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of know the feeling like there's so many people that become friends with Paul just to become friends with me. So I, <laughs> I get it. I, I feel you. Well, you uh -huh. see, that, that puts Paul in my, yeah, that, that, that we have something in common, Paul. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck you, Danny. <laughs> um, Saw an opening. I had to. <laughs> I wouldn't return to you if you didn't. <laughs> so because we, we touched upon it a little bit and it's not a nice subject. So we'll, we'll just kind of go through it quick. So people have a bit of an idea. Can you give us a quick overview of the situation that manifested with Freeman, like how you met him, how it ended up this fucking funeral happened and how we got to here to this. Uh, yeah. I, I, I never met him. Um, right. The, uh, you know, he just popped up when, when the news, uh, all the newspaper, the, the news people were, were doing uh, stories on it. He popped into the, into the scene as far as I knew. I mean, again, I was living in the woods and didn't know much about anything. Right. And, uh, and to be honest, the, the first time, the first couple contacts I, I try, I, I reached out to him offering support and, right. and just never heard back from him. And, and, that was the first clue that something was was uh, a little shady. Little shady, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, it it went from there. I mean, most people could see it coming, you know. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it just took a what, what do they say? Uh, Charlie, you say it. It only takes a minute. Yeah. You ever hear yep. that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It took me about two days. I'm a little bit slower. <laughs> <laughs> Like it's, it, this, this is something ain't right here, you know, and right. and then talking with other people and, and discussing things. I mean, it it sure, you know, it, it, it became, did, right. That, it didn't go the way that it should have, right? Especially when when you're putting yourself out there to to be like, let's put this to bed, let's mm -hmm. get it done, fuck, get out of here, right? And uh, I yeah. I. I would, I, I would have never been involved if, if you know, I, I mean, if I didn't see a need, you know, I didn't want anything. I didn't want to, I don't want to be on your show right now. I know. <laughs> I, I don't want to be on my show right now. <laughs> no, I mean, 
Uh, no, I'm glad. Yeah, I'm I'm glad to be here. But um, but you know, I I wasn't looking to to get to gain anything, you know. Um, uh, and boy, I sure didn't. You know, I I used to have a four hundred one k. The players just eat it right up, you know. Yeah. Oh man, the it's well, it's that's the thing too. And like when whenever you talk about anything. It, there's never even the slightest hint that it's like, oh, I'm going to milk the fuck out of my dad being Charles Manson. Like, right. oh, I'm definitely going to cash in on this, considering you've been on like three shows reluctantly. <laughs> right. Like, it doesn't make sense. If you were if you were whoring yourself out all over the place, it'd be a different story. But like, it doesn't even make sense. That's like, People saying that you're doing it for greedy reasons are the same people that are like two plus two is seven. Yeah. Right? Like, <laughs> yeah, you know, um, you're growing up and, 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 and up until, well, maybe, maybe the year before Charlie died, I haven't, I haven't gotten much since, since Charlie died, but I, I would get calls at least once or twice a year of people wanting to want me to do interviews and pay me this and pay me that. And, and, you know, no, I don't have anything to say. The one guy, and here's a little story for you. I I was working at a at a big paper mill, uh, and I, I was, you know, kind of buried in. It was up north, and you you know nobody knows nothing. And all of a sudden, this guy starts calling around the mill to different different areas looking for me. Oh, I I want to talk to him about a paid interview. And what does a person do in today's age when somebody says I want to I want to, to talk to this guy about a paid interview? Google and you know it just outed me, you know. Oh, fuck yeah. yeah. Um, Did anything come of that, or were they just like, holy shit? <laughs> no, I mean, the, I work with good. You know, I mean, I, I'm around good people, and it, you know, no, it wasn't, it wasn't anything. But it's not his business, anybody's no, business. Of course to, not. To uh, to disrupt one's life like that, you know. I mean, my my life was where it was, and now he's he's changing my life, and it's right. not his business. And boy, I, I laid into him, but I was so impressed because after I, I just shellacked him for about five minutes, you, you know, on the phone, of course. And well, maybe you could come on our show and tell us how you feel about that. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Give up, man. Just fucking soul suckers. <laughs> My God! Yeah. I just, I, you know, I didn't know what to say anymore. I just hung up and I walked away. Man. I mean, it's you know? like, how do you even? You're just like, oh my God! It's like talking to a wall. <laughs> oh uh, my God! I mean, he was dedicated to his job. You know, I feel. I mean, he did. He's doing his job wrong, but sure. you know, maybe that's the way he's trained to do it. And you know, well, but there's he, cutthroat yeah. journalism, right? Like, there's people mm -hmm. that will do horrible things to get the to get the scoop and that's their like you say that's their job but that doesn't make them any less of a piece of shit yeah, like yeah. all those tmz guys who are up everybody's ass like a suppository those right. guys are all fuck faces but they're they're doing their job but they're still fuck faces all right yeah. Paul, enough yeah. talking about you okay yeah thank you <laughs> <laughs> um so okay so we've we've gone through a bunch of stuff and we i'd like to switch things over and we can uh dig into daniel a little bit but to do that i think it would be it would be a really neat thing to do to actually bring somebody who's known him a little bit longer than you have up knows the history a little bit better knows the history a little bit better mm -hmm. would you like to Without naming names, would you like to introduce our uh, our next guest here? How do you introduce somebody without naming names? This is, this is <laughs> Danny's Danny's daughter, and yeah. she's here to um. To, uh, Danny Danny would love to be here, I should say, but but uh, you know he's he's in the middle of a a court thing, and he's been instructed to keep his pie hole shut. So right, you know um. He's doing that. He's doing everything that the, the that he's being told to do. So, but um, you know, I'm here. At, and what I say is just hearsay, and really, what what Danny's daughter says is not necessarily Danny's opinion. It's just hearsay, right? So we we right. you know, we're talking a little bit. Yeah, yeah, but it's but we will get the uh, we'll get the opinion and the hearsay of somebody who who knows him quite well. Can Can you do a drum roll? 
Yeah. <laughs> Danny Star. Thank you very much for being with us. Hello. Hi. Hi. How's it going? It's going Hi. well. Thank you very Thank much you for, for being us. here. Oh, thanks for having me. That's Hi, Danny's amazing. daughter. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Uncle Mike. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I love calling him Uncle Mike. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Well, like we were just saying, what a what a wild thing to be, you know, be alive as long as you have. Know that your father was looking for his family mm -hmm. and then finding this family and having it be what it is. Can you maybe if you want to start off by telling us how how you were told? and what what happened with that yeah oh my gosh it's actually really crazy i didn't think it'd be important later in life but my I, my grandmother sort of um was really close in my life and with me and she would pick me up from school half the time um when my mom couldn't um and my dad would pick me up from school. They were divorced. So on my mom's right. time, my mom wouldn't pick me up. My grandmother would. My dad's mom would. Right. And her, uh, she always, oh, well, actually, I guess I should say I was in elementary school and my mom was kind of like, I remember this. I was in the Ralph's parking lot and we were backing out of a parking spot. And my mom was like, yeah, well, your grandmother was a very bad girl. She was a bad teenager. And I'm like, why? And my mom said, well, she had a one night stand at 17 and had a kid, um, which is my, which is your dad. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> and, wow. and so I always knew um, my last name wasn't my blood last name. And I would go around school in an elementary school and, and be like, you know, my, you know, Arguelles isn't really my last name. It's, it's not my blood name. That's my dad's stepdad's last name. We don't know who his dad oh. is. <laughs> right. And I was curious from elementary school. I'm like, huh, I wonder who my dad's dad is. Um, so I, that's how I found out. I, my mom just told me she got pregnant at 17. And, you know, when I when I had guts and when I was, like, really young, I'd be like, Grandma, who's my dad's dad? You know, he wants to know. Um, yeah. You know, she'd always say, you know, I don't know. I don't know who he is. And so what can you really do with that? You can't really press her or anything. Um, no, of course not. You think it's, no, that's just the truth. That's, you know, she doesn't know. How can she answer this question when she doesn't know? Um, so, and I think it started out that way. I don't think she knew who he was um, until she saw him appear on the news. And 10 years after he was conceived, my dad was conceived. So, yeah, she didn't know for 10 years. And then she recognized him and... Uh, and decided to take it to her grave. Can, wow. can you? So she. Sorry, go ahead, Mike. Can can do you want to talk for a minute about Charlie Deer? Yeah, yeah. So when my dad actually matched with Mike, and I can go into this later. He told me, and I'll tell you how I found out and what my reactions were later. But he told me I matched with Michael Brunner. And I was like, how, okay, the second DNA test is on its way. Is there a chance that it's not your dad? And he was like, well, when I was in my 20s, I confronted your grandmother and said, you know, is blank my real father? And she said no. And all he told me was his name was Charlie Deere, and he had just gotten out of prison for white slavery. So with that timeline and that name it's pretty close you know charlie charles that yeah. makes me feel like he is my dad and it makes sense and and um and then later we actually this is before i talked to nicholas shrek so nicholas knew this already and this is nicholas has done this research but actually one of my friends went on google and looked in the fbi some fbi archives and saw some kind of police report and she sent me the police report and lo and behold, he used the name Charlie Deer, D-E-E-R-E. -E -E. We thought this whole time it was D-E-A-R. So right. we, you know, 
we heard we saw Charlie Deer in this FBI report and we're like, holy shit, you know, he did use Charlie Deer. He wasn't lying, you know, he, about his last name, really. He, that was the last name he chose to use. And I asked Nick, one of his last names, one of the last names. Yeah. And according yeah. to Nicholas, who I talk with frequently, and he's an amazing source of knowledge, that guy knows like virtually everything and anything. Um, he said that Kathleen was dating some guy named Deer. So he took that name at the time which is really weird because my dad didn't know his real last name either. And he would use different last names growing up as well in his entertainment industry. He wouldn't really use the last, the Spanish last name Arguelles. People would bring him in thinking he's Spanish and he'd turn up white and they're like, what the heck? So he would change his name, you know, to like some other last names. He would kind of just make up with his, with, with some people, but, um, yeah, between Charlie Deere, you know, getting out of prison in 59 for white slavery, um, and then matching with him on Ancestry, it was pretty locked and loaded. And then the second DNA test came in, and that's when we got, you know, that super high percentage. And it, like, says, right. on, it says on the DNA test, like, Michael Brunner and my dad, uh, it is 99.99998% probability that they share the same biological father um right uh that's what my grandmother grandmother said you know charlie he she said the truth up until 69 <laughs> uh she, right. she stuck with the story she had for 10 years um and and i understand why with all the media press and coverage you know no one knows the truth People learn the truth decades later in books. You know, you don't learn right. the, truth in the media. You don't learn the truth on the internet. So how would she have known? How would anyone have known? Um, I, people my age especially, only know him through Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And that's how I learned about him. I was 17 or 18 when that came out. Or 19? 19. And, uh, and I'm a huge Quentin Tarantino fan. So I Googled. Once upon a time in Hollywood context, and then I read it on Wikipedia, and I think it's the truth. So, yeah. right, uh, and yeah, so um, I understand why she took it to her grave. It's pretty, pretty dark stuff. Do you, do you think that um, that she, when she saw Charlie on the on the TV in in sixty nine or seventy, that that things changed in in the home? Yeah, absolutely. So when. I found out, I was like, oh my God, dad, you know, that's why they kicked you out. That's why they hated you. Um, that's why you got, beat up. that's why you got, yeah, yeah, no, they, it was terrible. Um, they, they did not accept him as he was and not who, you know, they, they totally uh, abused him because of it. Um, so I, I always, Look, I, I want to say this. My dad has been like the best dad you could ever ask for. Um, he fought to keep me in his life when, you know, my parents were divorcing and he, like Charlie, didn't have a proper education. He was on the street as a kid. So he had to prove that he could earn money to keep me. And he did that and he got a real estate license and, you know, people were telling him, you know, you're not going to last, you know, a year with them taking care of your kid. Um, and he fought really hard and, and he couldn't give me much financially, couldn't give me much opportunity wise. You know, he didn't have family supporting him. His mom didn't support him. Um, but he would tuck me in every night. And I could see, I could see this look in his eye of sadness as he was just telling me, like, you know, I never got to know my father, and that's left a very deep hole in my heart and void in my life. So it was so important for 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 me to know that you know your dad every day of your life, and that's why I'm doing this, and I love you so much. And he never went a day without, you know, telling me he loves me or holding my hand or hugging me or, you know, um. He was so loving. He is so loving and deserves to be. Um, 
he always said, like, no one has taken responsibility for my life. My mom kicked me out. My mom doesn't care about me. I have no dad. No one has taken responsibility for my whole being and life. Like, do you know what that feels like? I'm, he's just been alone very, very long. And until, and, and all he has is me. So we are very close. Um, and it was just such a blessing to find a fucking half brother. Oh, that's like a, <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, like my chest, just saying it out loud. I ha like saying all those dark things all at once. And then saying like a half brother and we found Mike like physically takes like a hundred pounds off of me. Um, and actually there's so many similarities between Charlie and my dad I could go into, but one of them is my dad at first, he was like, no, I don't want anything to do with that. I don't need to know who Mike is. You know, I want nothing to do with that. This is before we know knew the truth. We want the truth. And I said, like, dad, he's family. He's what you've been looking for. I think you should talk to him. And so he kind of brushed it off. And a couple of days later, he's like, so I thought about what you said. And I, I reached out to Mike and he's a really cool guy. And I was like, oh my God, that's great. So cool. You have a brother. And, and then I didn't talk to Mike for a while. It wasn't until like, I saw a text message come in from my dad's phone. And it was Mike saying like, how, how's Sophia? And he asked a question about me. And I'm like, oh my God. Oh, he's you watched your film. Oh, you, oh yeah, 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 no, that's cool. I have a short film. So he was asking about my short film screening. He was like, how did that go? And I'm like, Mike is asking about me? He cares about me? That's so cool. I have to talk to him. So that's how he started talking. And, and like, it's so amazing. I, I never would have thought my dad found it would find his dad, first of all. But second of all, to have someone like my dad in my dad's gene pool to talk to, I can I connect I feel like I connected with Mike so easily and so well and I have another family member besides my dad to talk to. Um and we talk every week, you know, we text almost daily, phone calls and all of that. So it, it really is like we found family you know um it's awesome it's beautiful and and just wow that's what you just said about your dad is that holy mackerel mm -hmm. like what a it's a thing that we talk about a lot is um you know how manson was brought up and mm -hmm. how it never had any mm -hmm. sort of any sort of sturdy ground to stand on. Absolutely. And not. when you, and, and like going through, going through life in this horrible situation, it's, it's really, it's really easy to get lost in it. If there's not even one person to take you by the hand and be like, this isn't it. Right. And, and, that, and I, go would, ahead. I would say that I know that because my dad has been telling me about his instability for 23 years. I just, right. and parallels between my dad and Charlie are actually insane. Like they lived parallel lives. I think um, the one, th like a couple things are different, but like one of the things he's different from Charlie is like, he got a break, you know, someone gave him a job cutting vegetables and actually saved his life is so that he right. wouldn't be stealing and he wouldn't like commit crime. My dad kept right. his nose really clean because he was given an opportunity and he was shown some compassion and love. Um, and then someone else gave him a break uh, um, and, and taught him how to ride motorcycles. And so he got a job and a couch to sleep on. You know, he wasn't growing up in prison with bad people but he was on the street and he was given breaks. He also was six foot and really good looking. And then, you know, someone discovered him off the street and he became a supermodel. So there was just, <laughs> and he's pretty, pretty man. <laughs> <laughs> but that being said, my dad always, and this was before we even knew who his father was. He always attested to those, you know, miracles. He could have gone down a much darker path. Um, yeah. Because he did not get any hand holding it, from his parents. Obviously, he got hand holding and and some security and stability from 
pretty interesting, generous, cool people in Southern California. Um, and so I don't, I don't, like you guys were saying how no one really cares um, about this. I don't expect anyone to empathize with Charles Manson the way I do because I grew up and was raised to the closest thing you could get to Charles Manson and I see as human and and, right. and, and his um you know Gary Fleischman how do you say his I think that's how you That's say it. it Fleischman yeah Fleischman you know he admitted to Linda Kasabian lying on stand and getting away and to like Charlie you know could maybe could have getting off free uh, if he had a competent lawyer. And then at the end of it, he's like, well, but he still deserves no sympathy, no empathy. And I'm like, you're fucking kidding me, right? You, like, but this is people's attitude toward him. The, he deserves sure. no empathy. He isn't human. He has no sympathy. But um, I, I'm i one day going to be like, I, 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 um, I wish I could stress it enough to people that Charlie and my my dad got that loving, caring gene, not from nurture because no one nurtured that into him and not from his mom. He got it from his dad. He got it from his dad. You know, there's a reason why a bunch of girls were around him and that, you know, they were writing, Lynette's writing how loving he was because he was. And so I got that. And my dad could give me that because his dad was like that. And it's, it was literally in his DNA. He has some other stuff in his DNA, like some emotional abruptness and like, you know, a really sure. street fighter, tough guy, you know, always on the defense because um, that's just, you know, that, that's just what happens when you're in a life of instability and insecurity. Um, of course. They never instigate fights or instigate anything. They just, they're on the defense. They're on, they're, they're protective. So, you right. know, he would be very protective of me, very protective of his family, and I'd see that, and I kind of have it too. Um, so sure. it, it's, uh, and then it's funny because I thought that was just my dad's personality. I didn't realize it came from his dad that was missing, you know, that we didn't know. But once right. I got to know him through the books and interviews, I was like, oh my God, this is my dad. This is my dad in the parole hearing, and I'm crying because I see the same sadness in Charlie's eyes that I saw in my dad's eyes tucking me in at bed, at bedtime. Um, right. So, oh, we're, yeah. <laughs> we're going to go from that. I don't know. <laughs> no, there's, so there's one, there's one moment in a, in an interview that Manson did with, um, I forget what the guy's name is, Super Sweaty Cokehead. Um, but it, he was in, I think he was quite medicated during it, but the guy kept pressing him. He's like, what would you say to your son? What do you got to say to your son? Mm -hmm. And, and yep. the way he looks into the camera mm -hmm. and goes, you got to catch it on your own boy. Yeah. Ways uh, hard. Roads rough. Yeah. And that's it. And it's like, but then he says, you know, that's he, more, sorry, go ahead. You know what he says afterwards though? What? He says, but they'll do it better than me. They always do. Right. Right. Kids always do it better. Which and is crazy because my dad would say that to me. My dad would say, you're going to do it better than me. I, I, I'm i trying to pursue my stuff in the entertainment industry and like he did at one time. And and he would be like, ah, kids always do it better than their parents. <laughs> so yeah. they it's they always, they have the same sayings too. Like uh, I heard Charlie Sna say shniveling. Like I'm not a shniveler. Like, yeah. I don't snivel. Who says that? I don't know. He does. But then my dad would say that to me. He'd be like, quit your sniveling. And, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, I read in Lynette's book that Charlie gave a pep talk to the girls. And he'd be like, you know, at first, when you're first learning how to walk, you crawl. And then you walk. And then you take a few steps. And then you'd fall down. And then you take another few steps. And you fall down. And then you keep going. And you learn how to walk. That's exactly what my dad would say. So I don't know how right. that happens in DNA, but like their sayings and their words and their verbiage is the same. I'm kind of freaking out about it out loud to you guys. So I apologize for that, but that's, it's fine. Like it's how all of you guys are, are able to navigate this, it, especially, well, and you guys are so new, 
new to it and it's so much closer like all of us we're fucking nobody in this whole thing this is your family like this is your guys's lives and so like for the record you're doing amazing this is is wonderful to hear this stuff about danny and about you and about someone like from what manson came from and his upbringing and in and out of homes and not a single leg up in his life and having to like like he had to be a manipulator how do you survive on the street how do you survive with a whole bunch of people that'll cause you physical harm all the time mm -hmm. all around you um but to have it be like what's left of that is mike and danny mm -hmm. and you and you guys are are positive and you guys are you guys are steadfast and strong and it's it's really that's the beautiful thing to come out of it and that's the they'll always do it better the kids will do it better right yeah i think mike dad and i are cut from the same cloth um as he is i i uh i believe that i um i think we are only able to handle it because he was able to handle it. And whatever I'm going through or Mike is going through, or my dad's going through, I just think about how much worse Charlie got it and how much worse Charlie had to deal with. So whenever I'm like down about it or, uh, you know, really hurt by what happened or what's happening, I'm like, Oh fuck. I'm not, you know, in solitary confinement, <laughs> you know, right. I, uh, I don't, my face isn't on the cover of Life magazine for something so heinous. Um, right. It's actually really interesting because my dad, whenever we'd like pick movies to watch, he would always, he had an, he has a, an aversion to violence and blood and, and like just violence period. And he would call himself a pacifist. And I'd be like, okay, whatever, dad, like, it's just some like movie stuff, whatever. Right. Um, but then, and my, my, I, but then you find out who his dad is and it's like our bloodline is known for violence somehow. Right. And I think mm -hmm. I'm actually like my dad is one of the least violent people I know and the most loving. So it's really weird to um, realize that we're known for like the complete opposite. So that's a weird thing. Um, but we handle, like you said, but I think we do handle it. We have good head on our shoulders because we are cut, you know, from similar cloths. It's, it's interesting what you said about um, looking at like what Manson went through and comparing it to yourself when you start to get down in the dumps. Like my, my grandparents were both Holocaust survivors, mm -hmm. lost limbs, all sorts of shit like that. Right. And that was, and I knew that since I was a little kid. And so a lot of stuff was like, there was that bit of reality in there. And, yeah. and always being able to be like, it could be worse, kiddo, mm -hmm. a lot worse. Yeah. And, and that's, that's a crazy baseline to have for yourself and to be, but to look at it and not turn away from it and embrace it the way that you have is super admirable and, and look at it the way that you have, like, not like scared, but mm -hmm. I can learn from this and I can use this to better myself. It, yeah, yeah. It's interesting you bring that up and I thank you for that. But when I first found out and I thought, you know, he was a cult leader, serial killer. Um, I, what I had, I, my first instinct was to face it and learn everything there was to learn. Cause I had to just face it. I, you know, I'd look at his interviews at first and I'd be like, you damn son of a bitch, liar, motherfucking murderer. Ah, like why, why would you yeah. do that? Um, and I'd look in the mirror at my brown eyes and my thick eyebrows and I'd be like, I can't believe it, you know, but yeah to face it i had i decided to read books so by the time i was only halfway done with chaos i'd look back at those interviews and i'd be like oh my god he's telling the truth i right he said he's that's the ultimate gaslighting like ever those interviews he's telling the truth and no one believes him because everything's been printed and set in stone and written on the wall and um but the 
for me, I had to just face what he did and face my DNA. And it's a relief, actually, that what the truth really is. So right, I was I was planning to go into it, like facing the terrible things and the terrible person that he is. And I was actually relieved because it's a lot more than it's a lot more complex than once upon a time or home. And, elder, obviously, you guys know, so. and it's more and it's more normal. It's yeah. not it's yeah. not a horror movie. It's like yeah. as if it wasn't if it wasn't Charles Manson, it, there's there's tons of people whose parents are criminals. Oh yeah. There's tons of people whose parents were involved in all sorts of horrendous shit. Yep. But it's just because of that extra, that mm -hmm. super microscope that that's been under. It, he's it, a fucking, it just, he's an sorry, anomaly. Go ahead. He, sorry, I just want to say he's an anomaly. He's an outlier. Right. No mm -hmm. one, no one is put through a microscope like he was and blown out of proportion like he was. So well, him and Dracula. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So I'm I'm agreeing with what you're saying. He's just an outlier. There are lots of criminals out there. Lots of people, lots of criminals who have killed other criminals. We don't hear about them. He they're not on the cover of life. They're not making movies and millions of dollars off of them. It's just because it's like a cluster fudge. I'm cussing a lot and I'm realizing that. So it's a cluster. That's fudge. It's me. Don't worry about it. I, oh, it's all no, I do. You're being. You're just being raw and real. And yeah, self censor yourself, please Thank don't. You. Uh, I'll say it. it was a clusterfuck of the times, and mm -hmm. it was the hippie movement, and it was Nixon, and it was the CIA, and it was the mafia, and it was so so many things. And and he was at the wrong place at the wrong time with the you know, the charisma that he had, the talent that he had, the the experience of being in prison. And at the time that was in hippies were like, whoa, the man fucked you over. What's that like? And, right. and they're interested in him. He's got stories to tell. You know, he didn't have any parents and he he can survive on the street without parents. And they couldn't. They didn't know how to. So, you know, it's it was a huge like it was the perfect storm, perfect storm for him to be absolutely the person he is, and and you know no other criminal, you know, getting what he got. Weird. Yeah. <laughs> how how long have you known about this? <laughs> Feels. Like... I mean, <laughs> you know, I know. When I was at at eight months into into my looking into it and that's after 50 some odd years you got it down <laughs> you know i mean you, you represent yourself so well what, what what other books have you read um besides uh, chaos yeah um chaos goodbye helter skelter reflection and the manson file manson file is like a college textbook so i can't say yes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I really, I'm, I'm, you know, page by page, excerpt by excerpt. Um, you know, I feel like I've been preparing for this my whole life. Actually, I've known right. for ten months, but I was in English honors and, you know, AP lit in high school. I wasn't very good at math or science, but I loved to critically think, and I liked to read. Um, and I read classic American novels because that was a part of our, um, like, uh, mandated, like, learning. Uh, what's it called? It's a, uh, but anyway, like, the government gives these public schools an assignment, and it's, and ours for that year was, like, American literature. So my grandfather, actually, when I was reading Reflection, I'm like, oh, my God, he's like a Huckleberry Finn or called in Hoff like Hofield, like from Catcher in the Rye. He is such an American literary kind of icon, question mark. Like, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, that is, it's funny you say that. It was reflection to me totally reads like a travel journal. Mm -hmm. And and it does have that real like American folk epic feel to it. And that was kind of what Manson lived, was like this insane... Uh, yeah, like a, a folk movie. His whole yeah. life was is growing up in prisons, 
learning. And that the other thing that's crazy that I just need to mention is it just goes to show how shit the prison system is considering if you had somebody that was a blank slate you put in there for most of their life if it was working they'd come out as a you know perfectly functional member of society mm. meanwhile to survive in prison you have to be a better criminal than the next guy oh yeah so, <laughs> yep incredible it yeah and just like learning i love nick's book because um that's how i started to first learn about charlie's personality and his um life and and his mom's life as well as in Lynette's book but like for example I didn't understand the concept of not snitching I'm like why dad like grand like granddad Charlie why in these interviews don't you just say the goddamn truth and just like out with it just stop dancing around it if you're not guilty you're not guilty or whatever if you are guilty you are guilty just say it like what really happened and then I read in Nick's book that he had grown up in the prison system and he saw someone get cut in half because some other jail prison guy thought that that guy was a snitch. So he learned right then and there, he witnessed a murder as like a young boy because that guy snitched and he saw them dump him in a dumpster and this was on accident he didn't mean to see this he was like sweeping and doing some kind of job in, mm -hmm. in prison and he saw the body roll out of the dumpster because he was a snitch and when the cops came to him and they were like did you see anything charlie said see what right like he, like he knew snitches <laughs> end up in ditches so yeah. I understood at that with that story that no one else knows unless you read the book, which, you know, I, you know, uh, I realized he didn't snitch because he's a survivor. Yeah. He also, well, did, he didn't also didn't necessarily lie. So it's a weird dance. He walked the line. There was a couple of, yeah, there was a couple of things. The one, the thing on him not snitching and him holding that so dear to him is if you, your education, your whole life coming up in that mm -hmm. is you snitch, you're fucking dead. Then that's your, that's in your DNA. Then that's, mm -hmm. that's what, what you do. And um, I think somebody called it, I think it was actually Nicholas I talked to and he said it was like dry snitching. You never, he, he would say things that would point in the direction of the truth, but it would right. be just off enough. Like you say, walking the line that he couldn't get pinched for it. Cause it's like, you, you say like, why didn't you just say it? Like if you're not guilty of this stuff and why don't you just say it? He would have fucking been killed. Right. He the like, like his whole reality is like, if he said that, then like, not only is he looking over his shoulder now, but times that by a billion and, and just release the hounds. And the public wouldn't know that, you know, public doesn't see that. And you're right. He would like point you in the direction, but you, no one's going to read the books and no one's going to do the research. They're just going to look at newspaper or the, the trial um, yeah. and, and believe that. I think the biggest thing learning about my grandfather, I was 22 at the time. So I, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm 23 now, but I realized when I was 22 um, I thought I could trust the court system. I thought I could trust the media. I thought I could trust the president. I thought I could trust people who were educated in these higher powers, um, and these high positions. And then I realized you couldn't. And the guy who never passed the third grade was actually the one who never really led me astray. That was a big thing. So I kind of look at the world very differently. Um, it was uh, pretty earth shattering, not just to realize it mm -hmm. happened to my granddad, but also to realize this is how the world actually works. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, no one, no one in the public would really understand that unless it's happened to them, which is like kind of a sad part. You can tell people this doesn't mean they're going to retain it or understand it. And right. And I have to say, I was one of those people. If someone said that to me, actually, my dad would say stuff to me that I'm like, dad, that's so, that's conspiracy talk. That's conspiracy theory. I don't want to hear about that. You know, 
I trust, I trust people who are in higher powers. Right. But Mm -hmm. until it happened to me personally, uh, Mm -hmm. then I was able to realize how the world really worked. So, uh, you know, if I come out with all, like if, if, you know, I mean, people have come out with it and there's chaos and there's goodbye and Helter Skelter and the Manson file. But uh, you really, you can't, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't lead, you can't force it to drink. Yeah. So, no. Um, that's kind of, you know, I've accepted that. Yeah. It's, there's a whole generation of people that, that it's their generation that it happened to, yeah. that the news was, was the law, right? Like it was yeah. the, the Bible and it's tough to break people of that. And that, I mean, to, on the other side of things too, for people who didn't know at the time, that's traumatic. Like they had no idea. They thought it was like a, a night, like what ended up being the night stalker thing. They thought it was completely random yeah. because, because there was nothing about any of the sort of nefarious stuff going on behind the scenes of Hollywood. Yes. And, and the other stuff that was happening. So it just looked like these two random killings by people that you see everywhere because right. they and look like hippies. And so that fear, you can't break that with some people. Like you, you mentioned this to them and it's like they have a fucking panic attack. Absolutely. Absolutely. You're right. And um, I, I've talked to people actually who are from that generation. I had a friend, childhood friend, um, and his dad, her dad is an entertainment lawyer and her mom is also part of that generation. And I had to tell them who I was in this context and they get scared. They get frightened. So the dad kind of just left the room. He didn't judge me or anything and he was going to help me out with something. Um, but he, I was actually explaining everything to the mom and she would, you know, give me some points that she knew and I would refute all of them because I know a lot more than she does mm-hmm. as, as far as, you know, all she knew was Helter Skelter, right? Right. Um, of course. So yeah. I could see some breakthroughs with her given it was only an hour and a half, but I could see her like coming to a, 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 a dead end and her just like nodding. You know, she never knew Linda Kasabian got off free. She thought... You know, actually, I saw her just on the news the other month wanting um, uh, parole or whatever. And I'm like, that wasn't Kasabian. Kasabian has been free the whole time. And she, you know, right. she didn't know that she would, you know, they don't know the basic facts. So I feel mm-hmm. like once you just tell people the basic facts, they're just like, things start to crumble down. Their whole belief system starts to crumble a little bit. But that's... Yeah. It's pretty rare you have, I mean, I can't repeat myself a hundred times to these. No, it's, it's ingrained in them. It's ingrained. There's, there's, there's certain things like my mom asked me if I joined QAnon when I fucking told her I was doing this, but, uh, she, the thing that was like, there's a couple things where you go, look at this, how fucked up is this? And they can't say anything. And one thing is that recording of Nixon talking about Manson. Have you heard that? You know, I've heard what he said. I actually haven't heard it myself. I'll I'll send you the link out. Yeah. There's uh yeah, there's him in the Oval Office talking what he thinks is just with whoever he's trying to get the uh the Watergate tapes. Mm-hmm. And and he says we knew exactly what we were doing with the Manson thing. You got to yeah. win some of them in the press. Yeah. And it's like to hear him say that. Mm-hmm. It's like holy fuck. When yeah. he's like we knew like, what we were doing. They needed some help. What's that? Yeah, they they were so worried about the Manson thing. It's like who the fuck was worried about the Manson thing? <laughs> Evel Younger? Like it's crazy. Yeah. They need some. They needed my help, or they. I forget exactly how it goes, but it he let, said, let me he said, who the they was. He said, "I remember they were so worried about the Manson thing. I knew exactly what we were doing with the Manson thing." I fucking listened to that thing so right. many times because it was just like every time you do it, it's like, is my nose bleeding? Holy crap. Yeah. Um, but there's, it's, yeah, it's, you can't, you can't beat people over the head with it. And I mean, it's not like, like they think immediately and, and, you know, rightly so immediately their head goes to Sharon Tate, a oh, pregnant yeah. woman, mm-hmm. and they'll just shut down. 
immediately. Yeah. Yeah. Like, what are you making excuses for this guy for? Yeah. But it's not that simple. No. And they don't look at they don't look at other communes and the yes. times in general. Yeah. Right. Like the this this isn't the only like violent commune that was out right. there. This yeah. isn't the only drug dealing commune. How about fucking the Brotherhood of Eternal Love? I mean, the the guy, the big acid tune in, turn out, drop, whatever the fuck. Tune in, drop he, out. Yeah, the, the uh T Leary, Leary was a part of of the Brotherhood of Eternal Love, and they were huge drug smugglers. So it's just like it, nobody had clean hands. No, no. And I, I actually always start off with telling people when I need to tell somebody, I always have to start off with, well, he was never a cult leader. It was never a cult. It was a nameless commune and they were by the hundreds in San Francisco and Los Angeles. So let's start there. <laughs> like once you kind of debunk the cult thing, people are like, oh, really? Whoa. And, and right. you kind of build from there. Right. It's it's tough, though, with all the misinformation out there and the people still spreading BS all over the place. I guess we're all hoping that and as this will bring it around for us to talk about the raffle again. I guess we're all hoping that you guys get some sort of piece out of this once and hopefully it goes all in the right direction. But once all this court shit's over, hopefully it's able to kind of the dust will settle. More people will start to to shift the thinking and it'll never be perfect because there's i mean there's 50 years of misinformation yeah. from mainstream media mm -hmm. from the high ups from everything that you just can't break through with everybody but you guys have each other now and that's fucking amazing yeah and and uh so what we're what we're talking about here and what what ben so rightly pointed out are you guys doing an auction or something Yes, we're doing <laughs> we're doing a raffle. Well, Mike and Daniel are doing a raffle to help get funds together for lawyers because lawyers drink money. And so so you got to, you know, it's it's so much to go through and there's been so much it's been 5 years, 5 years in court and different things happening and basically you guys just wanting to nip this in the bud you have people wanting to use it to for gain and then you have the people who are obviously the family being like no like fucking stop leave us alone like this is enough i i I've, I've heard a couple times recently people saying well danny didn't even know his his dad he's just in it for the money and I, I've seen, and you can you can say, tell them what you've seen, but I, I see a guy that again is is there to to protect uh, a family member. He's he's taking this thing on like that's my dad. That's that's my dad. That's my family. Right, and, and it's he doesn't. He's been up till now, right? Like he's all he's had. It's not like he's. It's not like he's been doing shifty stuff all the way up and now he's just some dude stepping in here he's made a life for himself he's taken like like uh like his daughter says here it's he's taken these little hands hands up that he's been that he's been able to to get that manson didn't so he understands both sides of things like he can see that and it's yeah, people to say that he's just in it for the money or, or or the fame or what? Who the fuck wants to be famous that way? And how much money is in it? Not how much. much. Money, yeah, I mean, everybody's everybody else is making money. That's making the salacious stuff. If they like, they grab the cult headline, they grab this and that, and because there's no repercussion for it, they're just able to do whatever they want. And they're the ones making the money. And it's not like, and somebody said too, it's like if if people win like if you guys won it's not like you're going to sue every single person out there that uses man because how could you you'd be in court for the rest of your life you'd have no money we, <laughs> we couldn't afford the lawyers anyway yeah <laughs> um but it, i i do want to say um kind of touch upon that point that you made about him really looking at charlie like he is his father and he wants the the, the estate because that's his father and not because he's money grabbing. Mm -hmm. um, 
I, I drove him to one of the hearings and we went in person and on the way back, he, you know, my dad doesn't cry often, but uh, he was kind of like broken up and in tears saying, um, I just want to protect him and no one cared about him. And I know what that feels like. So I care about him and I, I, I care about him and I want like a proper funeral and I want a proper burial. I think, you know, the proper ceremony that's not exploited. And um, my, and so I, I, I'll always kind of remember that moment driving back from the hearing and seeing how broken up he was about his dad and feeling like he, no one cared for his dad and no one cared about him. And I told him, you know, I care about you and I care about Charlie too. So I'm with you always in, in it, you know, till the end. Um, and then I also want to say my dad's mom died a few years back during the pandemic and she left my dad nothing. And my dad was broken up about that too. Like, why would my mom leave me nothing? It's like, no one wants to take responsibility for me. So his half brother got everything. And, um, and so when this came around, surprisingly, I was like, so dad, you know, you wanted your half brother to give you half of the estate, you know, what are you going to do with Mike? And if you get the estate and he's like, yeah, I'll, of course we'll split it because we're brothers and he's both of our dads. So we're, we're here for Mike too. And, um, we're here for Charlie. Um, and that's all. <laughs> You're fucking amazing. <laughs> Holy cow. So well said. <laughs> Holy man. You and your father are, are wow. Good. Like, holy cow. You are very wise beyond your years. <laughs> yeah. You just broke my brain and I don't even have anything left up there to break. It's incredible. Holy moly. Thank goodness for you guys. Thank goodness you all found each other. Honestly. Like, it's, it's the... It's the nicest thing to come out of this fucking chaotic, horrible mess. It's just such like a light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. And and thank you so much for talking to us about it. As far as I'm concerned, the rest really doesn't matter. I, I, I feel like I've gained so much already. And and really, they, the estate isn't like a gain. No, no. I don't even know who thinks it's a gain, but yeah. but uh, it. it it, it's been been great just the, the the ten months we've had together. I mean, um, conversations we've had, you know, about this and and so many other things. You know, I'm I'm learning so much about life in California and and uh, right. and just family. Cool. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting as you guys get to know each other more because there's always those familial sort of ticks and like mannerisms and stuff like that and the more you guys get to know each other the more that it's going to be like holy cow so i do that or really? like us and that's so neat i'm so jazzed for you guys <laughs> it's so awesome when you called him uncle mike when you oh my god i'm so like <laughs> yeah so good man such so positive so positive so I, I'm uh, a little bit sidetracked, but again, so we are here also to plug the raffle that Mike is doing um, with Daniel and Mike has put together three raffle prize packages that are amazing. Two. If three, isn't it two? two. It's three. three. Never mind. I'll shut up. <laughs> Paul, learn your place. Yeah. So yes, there are three yeah. great raffle packages the information with pictures of all, of what is in each package is floating. We have it on the podcast group, um, Abraxas. It's it's everywhere online. Um, and the tickets for it, it's twenty five dollars a ticket, or five tickets for a hundred dollars, or thirty nope. tickets oh, yeah. for five hundred. Yes, I said that right. Yes. Um, and again, these are you know Mike put together some really great packages. So if you're you're into the case. I mean, these are well, well worth that. If you don't want to, you know, if you're like, yeah, I don't need any of the raffle pack items, but I do want to donate, donate any cost will help. Lawyers are not cheap. 
So Mike is trying very hard to raise much money as we can. We are here to help Mike in any way, shape, or form. So anything people, we've gotten some great donations tonight. I think we're like just shy of 200 bucks of people just through here, which we will be donating, you know, giving, giving to Mike. So thank you everybody who's donated here. But again, 10 bucks, 20 bucks, five bucks, anything, PayPal, PayPal, it will go a long way. Out of every raffle that there could be or anything on YouTube, like this is hands down the best place your money, your money can go. I've, I've got some surprises sitting right here if you want to take a look. Oh, shit. Yeah, 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 show it. Well, before we do that, I'm just curious if uh, Danny's daughter could sing Garbage Dump. No, I'm just kidding. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just had to... You know what songs I love, though? Like, actually, and I will say this, I'm a huge Beatles fan. So actually, when I first found out about Charlie, I was like, oh, my God, I got my Beatles, like, a uh, fan, you know. Beatles. <laughs> the monkeys are better, but that's okay. I digress. Beatles. Easy, girl. I got the Beatle maniac from a, my fucking grandfather. That's weird and crazy. <laughs> And in, in a terrible way. And I actually cried one day thinking that Paul McCartney knows my grandfather, my last name, through this terrible instance. So oh. I, I really love the Beatles. They got me through a lot of stuff. But I love my world and close to me. Those songs I'll wake up. So thinking, good. I'll wake up thinking about those songs. Um, I'm learning to play uh, my world. It's so cool. So many cool jazz chord changes. Yeah. I, that was a big shocker for me was because I went to school for jazz and and some of the stuff he does, like the walking bass lines and the just yeah. like all this stuff that you're like, that's that doesn't sound like a shitty guitar player. No, no. And I was I, I didn't start listening to his music until a few months into learning about him. And I was kind of scared. But look at your game girl was like the first song on Spotify and my jaw dropped. I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. He's not bad. He's good. And then I got into my role and close to me and I just like my heart broke in a million pieces. I'm like, oh no, he's actually really talented and awesome. And that was a relief, but also super sad, but also super happy. So I yeah. can't sing garbage dump. I can I can <laughs> quote, I can quote close to me in my world probably word for word. I'm not as good of a singer, so I actually won't be singing. Um, <laughs> no, they're so, they're so good. That and Invisible Tears, if you like those. Yes, ones, yes, is, yes. Yeah. Is perfect, is the perfect triple play. Those yeah. three songs. Garbage Dump is actually pretty simple. We could teach it, teach you real quick. Yeah, yeah. If, if you want to see Uncle Mike do it, he actually did it for the LA okay. <laughs> yeah, so If you, you two want to just kick in, you ready? On three? Yeah. yeah. One, two, three. Oh, garbage dump. Oh, garbage dump. <laughs> You're welcome, oh, Mike. <laughs> you gotta that one. Wow, yeah. we just lost 50 viewers. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, so man. Funny. Okay, so, Mike, if you want to show some of the uh, the raffle prizes, I'll just uh, I'll make you full screen, and you can people can check them out. I'll, I'll, I've just got just a couple here. We already looked at that album and and uh, that insert, and then the, there's also the the uh, lost Vacaville tape uh, yeah, album, beautiful. and that has got a huge insert in it, uh, twenty some odd pages, lots of pictures. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, you're gonna love it. The uh, artwork. This folds up into a kite. I think I got that right. It just folds up nice and small, but then you open it up. And voila. Wow. And then there's a note here on the back. Um, yes, Lynn is a good brother, even if she is a chick. <laughs> <laughs> Easy. Easy. <laughs> To MM, I'm not sure who MM is, but um, this is a, a picture of Charlie, and he, he signed it in his own hand. Mm. And I've got, I think this is the coolest. This, I mean, the picture that's is so cool. So cool. And then uh, yeah. one of his used guitar picks inlaid in there. Yeah, that's so yeah. neat. 
You know what I'm super curious about is that that packet of CDs. Like, what did Manson listen to? Yeah, um, I got that here too. I, while I'm talking about that, I, I can't thank the people enough that, that donated, man. I mean, they made this happen. I threw in an album, they did the rest. That's um, awesome, right on, thank yeah. you guys. The CDs, you know, um, I started listening to Above and Beyond because of the CDs in here. I don't know if anybody knows Above and Beyond, but I just saw, I just got a thing, a notification, they had a new album drop today. So oh, interesting. Above and Beyond. Um, Are there any Fleetwood Mac albums uh, there? Yeah, there's, um, no, there's not. <sighs> yeah, thank fuck. He, he, <laughs> had that, uh, he had that on his MP3 player. Ah, uh, really? Um, <laughs> I'm making <No>. stuff up. <laughs> <He's> <laughs> um, so look at, listen to this. Uh, Tibetan monk choir, a lot of throat singing. Or, or, or I, you know, I can't yeah. do it. So. You, you want to try that, Danny? No. <laughs> Some of this stuff, it's not really up my alley. Uh, so I'm not even sure how to, to uh, pronounce all this. But the majority of it is um, Tangerine Dream. You familiar with them? A lot yeah, of uh, them, yeah. instrumental. And this Above and Beyond. There's a number of, number of those CDs. And uh, a lot of them he's, he's scribbled on. Marking them for himself, I'm sure. More tangerine dream, tangerine dream. And listen to that stuff. It's kind of fun. Again, it's not really my thing, but here is a Juna Beats. Never listen. Oh, that's that's above and beyond. Above oh, okay. and beyond. Yeah, so it's, it's a lot of the above and beyond and tangerine dream and, and some and some throat singing to throw in that's there. That's awesome. So, yeah, I love that stuff. I learned about that stuff in college. It's so weird. You can hear the whistle and the false chords while they're going. Eh. It's it, crazy. It is really cool. We, uh, I was given that when we were, I, yeah, we talked earlier about starting in Vegas and going going to Barker Ranch, and the drive across the desert. We were playing a lot of that in the oh, car. Wow. Yeah. Oh, and wow. It was, it was really kind of surreal that you know we're in a caravan of people that we are kind of just meeting really for the first time and and <laughs> cranking up you know <laughs> things are flying by and there's there's donkeys looking at you and I mean, it's, it's just a crazy experience man <laughs> no I mean, kidding we we got kind of lost the first day out in the desert and i was driving a little rental car oh man i, I can't believe they they took it back because we beat the crap out of that car Drove it all the way across Death Valley. Not not on the road. They got roads on Death Valley. We drove on the trails. Oh, um, wow. Yeah, we got to a point where we couldn't get any farther and then had to drive back that same trail. It just got worse and worse and worse. So on the way out, it got better and better and better. But yeah, um, it, it was it was a crazy experience. Um, and I'll 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 always think of that that music that that box of CDs when. Uh, I think of that that trip because we listened to them over and over and over again going going through Death Valley. Yeah. Now really all cool. I want to do is listen to throat singing and look at a donkey. Uh... <laughs> oh, the donkeys are so cool. Yeah. They really are. And anybody that's been out there can attest to that. I mean, they're I don't know. And they're, they're talking about shooting them off. Like they they're not native, I guess. I had heard that a couple years ago. I don't, hopefully they they give that up because they they're right. cool to have wrong. Yeah, and like, yeah. They're I don't know if they people. are harmful to the environment, but it's, you know, it's a desert. <laughs> it's a desert, yeah. It's not going to, I mean, I, I mean, don't think if you get rid of the donkeys, it's going to turn into a rainforest. I, I don't, I mean, it is an ecosystem and they, they're not native, but they've been there since the prospectors have been there. I, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe their numbers go out of control. I don't know. But Those. I can keep going through prizes here. Uh, yeah, let's do it. You want to do some more here? Yeah. Um, the third prize is this piece of molten metal from – oh, let me pull this out here. That came from from Barker – or uh, Spawn's Ranch after the fire. It almost looks right. like a kitty. I, I saw that in the in the screen. Yeah, yeah. it's pretty cool. Whoop. Yeah. Meow. <laughs> and uh, – Get your own that. Spawn – get your own Spawn Ranch metal cat. <laughs> and um, 
This is the uh, uh, who else? There was somebody else on here that I give me just a second. Sure. Uh, I saw something on here, and who is Leslie? Uh, S A N K S T O N. I have no idea. No idea. That's probably Nick knows. <laughs> yeah, Nicholas, if you're good. out there. <laughs> Chime in on that. A friend? Yeah, yeah phone this, a friend. This is the indictment for uh, Charlie, Charlie Watson, Patricia Cramwickle, Susan Atkins, and Linda Kasabian. Maybe that's another name for Leslie Van Houten? Must be. Yeah, probably. I'm not an expert. Yeah. <laughs> I, bet you, I bet you what, Danny's daughter is going to tell us tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> let us know for sure. Let me just do a little bit of research and get back to you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is, uh, I'm not going to count the pages, but I believe it's signed in ink. This is a, uh, Charlie signed it afterwards. I, here it is again. I think it's signed three times, if I remember right. There's again, at least three times, we'll say. Right. I need a bigger, oh, okay. bigger camera. Okay, so we have somebody here named Day Lynn. Thank you. They said that's Leslie's AKA Samson. Thank oh. you, Day. Appreciate it. That's awesome. Um, you know, I could go on and on here. There's so much stuff. A lot of patches. Do, do, do. Right, cool. Awesome. Um, more patches here. Charlie says there's some of these. Just some right. odd, odd stuff that you've. You're not going to find. Here's an invitation to Manson the Musical. Oh, jeez. <laughs> uh, oh, and then this, along with the, I believe it goes along with the Lie album, the, uh, this is a copy of handwritten, um, Char Charlie wrote when and where and why he wrote different songs. That's awesome. So, when was Look at Your Game Girl written? Any idea? Uh, I'd say 1960 or 1959. 1959, written in prison. Now you know. Yes. Um, Eyes of a Dreamer was written in 1967, out on the road in Mendocino, California. So, wow. so... And there's yeah, fifteen songs there. So that's unbelievable, unbelievable. Yeah. People prizes. have just been so generous. I can't. I, I mean, I can't thank them enough. You know. I and, got a text and, from my auntie Mimi. She donated twenty five bucks. Oh, thanks, auntie Yay, Mimi. Yeah, auntie Mimi. <laughs> <laughs> oh, crazy. Oh it's, man, everyone's. I, I got to thank them, and I can thank everybody on the back end. Is I mean, again, again, it's just humbling the way people have, have opened up for us and, and, and helping us out. I mean, it, again, the, the, the lawyers, it, it's just amazing how it doesn't seem like anything gets accomplished except for the bill goes up every oh, month. Exactly. They're like, mm -hmm. it's $500 per eye contact. It's, <laughs> it's basically how it goes. It, it makes you wonder how anybody else has, has stayed in it um, for, for five years. Cause I mean, really, Danny's just getting started compared to these right. other guys. That, but they, they must have some kind of – either they're mortgaging their homes or, or uh, somebody's helping them out quite a bit. Right. It's, it's not a cheap endeavor. Right. They'll, they'll never break even from it, I don't think. No. <laughs> I don't no. Think it's not no. one of those things. I mean, um, before I got started, I, I you know, if you would have given me my money back that I put into the, the last bit, I could have bought a new car. <laughs> right, it's incredible, yeah. for sure. Yeah, they, yeah. But you know, I, I I just feel it's one of those things. And I I I mean, the the first time I was involved in 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 trying to to uh, uh, stop what was going on with Charlie's body, you know, I I knew I didn't have much of a chance. But you know, you got to try. I mean, you. It, the regret you'd have if you didn't at least try to, to help, you know what I mean? And, yeah. uh, um, and I had, I had a few bucks, 
add a few bucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But and that and that just goes to sh- and that goes to show your intention as well, where you're like, you're not a rich guy. You're not like it, and you're just like, this isn't like a lot of other people would just be like, fuck that. I'm washing my hands of this situation. But yeah. to actually like you're pushing up against a world of pressure as well as throwing your money at it and you're and you're willing to do it. And that's that's admirable. That's well, unreal. again, I, I, I just, you know, that the family thing just kicked in and and you, you just want to do the right thing for family. I mean, that's how it is. Yeah. I want to, I want to say this. I want, I want to express that, you know, I wish Mike got it five years ago and it was crazy, crazy to me to hear that he didn't. And my dad and I were surprised that he died five years ago, but his estate is still up for grabs. That doesn't make sense. Why doesn't Mike get it? He's the son. Um, And, and it's just, it's so kind of crazy to me just because he was adopted. They can't, no matter what the court says, no one can take away that you are Charlie's son. And that's what I right. tell my, my dad, my, my dad, you know, is like nervous about talking to people about being his son until the estate is, is his, um, which right. we hope it will be one day. But I, I have to like remind him and tell him like, you know, Mike is his son. And they told him, you know, go F yourself. You can't even take a DNA test and you won't get his estate because of this law or whatever, but no one can tell you you're not. And, and no one can take that away from you. They can think they can because they're, you know, the court system and whatnot, but no matter what were his, you're the, you, you are your, you are the kinship, you are his blood. And um, I, I think we, I think we have that, that passion and it doesn't matter at the end of the day, uh, what the judge says to me, I know my dad has more stake in it and Mike has more stake in it, but you know, just as a granddaughter, I'm just like, I don't give a flying fuck what that judge says. You are his son. Um, right. and, and, um, that's not gonna, you know, don't let him stop you guys from standing up for him or representing him or protecting him. You know, I think right. we can protect him and do good for him, even if they don't even if something bad goes wrong, like if something bad happens and it all goes wrong with that judge, we've seen co- the court system fail us before. It wouldn't be the first time. Right. So. And the, and the thing out of this huge bunch of stuff that's happened, somehow it's ended up linking you guys up. Mm-hmm. So of all this stuff that's happened, that's, that's the one thing that you guys can grab onto. And it's a big thing. I was just going to explain real quick for those that don't know. I think most people do know, but but for anybody that doesn't, um, the reason I wasn't eligible for any of that, I, I, I was when, when you're adopted, your rights are severed. So so basically, you're no longer their child. They're no no longer your parent. You you don't have any connection to them legally. Whereas right. Daniel was never adopted, so that that um, leaves him open. Thank you for explaining right. that in case anybody didn't know. Yeah, thanks for clearing that up, Mike. Um, so do you guys have, we're, we're at two hours. So if you guys have anything you'd like to add, um, please, absolutely. You guys have both been amazing. And, and thank you both for coming up here. Um, and for yeah. being so raw and so open and just vulnerable. And it, I just feel... You, you've, people can really connect to both of you more than, than we could ever tell for you guys. I'm just so glad you're both here to, to just express that. Isn't that young lady just amazing? I mean, she, she blows my mind every day. I mean, it's yes. something every day. Well, we had to talk that she's a dancer and I was like, Oh, I love her. <laughs> Thank you guys for having me. It really is an honor and a, and a great, opportunity to share and I, I love to share I'm sure you can you noticed <laughs> <laughs> well you're you're amazing at it you you are very articulate and and yeah. you there's nothing there's no slack in your act oh, you, you what you see is what you get you know what I mean <laughs> it's you, you're very 
it's very much appreciated. And, you know, and yeah. I know all the stories, and I was still moved just hearing you say them again. Aww. You know, yeah. I, and and um, I, did you know how Mike is talking me up and being so nice to me and saying great things about me? I, I only got that from my dad. So now I get it from another human, which is awesome. So I get it from two people in, in my family, and that's just really special. It means a lot to me. I think we we need that. Um, we come from a gen we have this generational trauma and this generational curse, I feel like, of not having family, but we're fucking breaking it this generation and it's really awesome. Right yeah. on. Fantastic. <laughs> so All right. Well, that. we're gonna we're going to uh take off. We're going to let these awesome people back to their lives. And and thank you very much for everybody who donated during the show. Thank you to everybody who's donating and getting tickets for the raffle and thank you guys. Yeah. Thank you guys again for sharing your story. It's we, we just everything you guys are doing for us. Just got it, a donation. 49 dollars oh, thank you so much. That's, that's, thank you very much for sharing your story with us. And with that, your truth, take care of yourselves and be proud of yourselves. We wish nothing but the best. You three are in our prayers. Thank you. So That's amazing. Much. Wow. Thank you, Patty. Thank you so much. Aww. And and now you're gonna be forever known as Danny's daughter. Yeah, <laughs> I'm okay with that. That's cool. Or right Carly, on. Carly's granddaughter. Whatever you yeah. want. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Mike's perfect. Niece. <laughs> yeah, Mike's niece. Mike's niece. Oh my god, I'm crying. <laughs> <laughs> oh man thank you guys okay. and we we will talk to you all soon i think we're gonna do a we're gonna have a break but then we might do a quick short after show just for ourselves to decompress if you guys want to stop in feel free if not then we will we'll talk to you guys very soon and thank you both so much for thank giving you. us your time thanks everyone man. it's been yeah. fun awesome bye for now everyone bye, -bye.